Bible Church, whether you're here in the room with us or at home, let's stand to our feet as we sing about the great things of our God and King. worship our King. Come let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Lift it up, oh hero of heaven, you conquer the grave, you free every captive and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things, we dance in your freedom, awaken alive, oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. Sing it, you've been faithful. You've been faithful through every storm. And you'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promises, yes and amen. You will do great things. God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken life. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. Yeah, singing hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable high. Done great things. Yeah. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. You've done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive, break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great things. You have done great things. God, you do great things. Yeah. Give our Lord a hand of praise this morning. He is worthy of it all. Amen. Buenos dias, Fleetwood Bible. So it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Welcome everybody here. For those of you who may not know uh, who this weirdly looking person is, uh, my name is Marcos Crespo. I'm one of the pastors here at Fleetwood Bible. Um, so again, welcome. If you are new here, 
We would love to get you, uh, to know you more, so if you can, uh, there's a card in your pew, if you could fill that out so we can uh, just follow up, get to know you a little bit more. We also have a gift for you outside, and, and we can chat a little bit. If you are tuning in online, and this is your first time tuning in, uh, we would like to connect with you too. If you go to our webpage, we have a connect card where you will be able to fill out some information. We can follow up with you that way as well. Uh, today, I have a couple of announcements for you, so uh, we ready? Yeah. Uh, now you're not ready. Y'all ready? Yeah. Let's go. Okay, first and foremost, time capsule. So kids, uh, this next week coming up, okay, next week, uh, we are going to send our time capsules 25 years into the future. So you will not be able to open it until 25 years. Now let me tell you, 25 years is a long time. Very, very long time. So. Make sure that you uh, fill, uh, there's gonna be a couple papers that you can fill out, put that in the time capsule, and then 25 years from now, we'll, we will meet it and we'll be like, oh, there it is. And we can see a little bit about how your year was going uh, in 2021. So there's gonna be some papers in kids' worship, so you can fill that out there, or there's also gonna be some papers in the stone ledge, you can fill that there as well. It's up to you, but definitely we wanna fill that out. Also, Nursery. Today after second service, there will be a meeting for all nursery volunteers and anyone who might be interested in serving. We need more volunteers to help us make the nursery available during the services. Uh, so let's actually, you know, let's help out our, our moms and our dads and, and let's just take, uh, you know, if we can have volunteers up there. We need, an, we need more volunteers to be able to have every Sunday filled. So if you are somebody that is feeling led to, to just know more about that, there's gonna be a meeting right after service in the fellowship hall. Also, nominations, okay, they are due today. So make sure you pick up one of the uh, recommendation forms, fill it out, they're gonna be in the stone uh, ledge and you could put that on the pop in, or you could pop that in in the office mailbox for consideration by our nominating committee. Ne uh, Sunday, October 17th. Between both services, we're gonna have a ministry fair. So maybe you are somebody that might be a little bit new to Fleetwood Bible, and you're like, man, you know, I, I feel like I wanna serve, I feel God leading me to serve, I just don't have any idea uh, what to do. Maybe you're someone where you're like, man, you know, I feel like I wanna serve, but I don't know what I'm good at, I don't know like what I could do. Or maybe you're somebody that has really high self-esteem and it's like, look, I got a lot of gifts, dude, okay? I could do anything. Uh, so if you're any of those people, you definitely wanna stick around for the ministry fair on October 17th. Uh, get to know all the ministry leaders and see where God leads you. And, and I have a feeling that as you meet every ministry leader, you will realize that uh, children and youth ministry is the way to go and you'll work with us amen praise God I'm not biased at all at all <laughs> also uh, last but not least free babe save the date here okay Saturday November 13th we will have free babe more details will come in the future but as of right now just make sure you save that date before I, uh, we move on I just want to know how many of you guys are Eagles fans I know I am we're in for a long season y'all sorry Sorry to be the bearer of bad news, uh, but I don't know what it is about Eagles games that right before, every Sunday that they're playing or even on a Monday night, I, right before the game, you know, I, even though I know it's probably not gonna end up well, especially this season, I get the butterflies, I get, I get excited, I'm like, let's go, Eagles, maybe, maybe this week, you know, maybe, maybe finally they'll get their act together and they'll finally win and figure it out. I know, right, you would think that I'd know better by now. Um, but I still get excited, and, and I wonder sometimes why is it that it's so easy to get excited over a football team that is not doing too hot, and the best thing that they can give me is a free Dunkin' coffee uh, if they win. And I, sometimes it's so hard for me to be that excited about worshiping and serving the King of Kings and serving the Lord of Lords, the one who gave his life for me. He has done so much more than Philadelphia sports has done in, to me. Uh, yet sometimes it's easier to get excited over that than it is over serving and worshiping the Lord. And I don't know, maybe there's reasons for that. Maybe sometimes it's just hard to keep up a prayer life that you know gives us that. Maybe sometimes it's hard to read scripture on a, a 
regular basis and, and see God there. Maybe we just haven't had a, an encounter with his spirit in a long time and have forgotten just how marvelous he actually is. Or, or even maybe our cases, some of us just have hidden sin that we're not willing to confess and to, to give to the Lord. I don't know what those reasons are, but I am grateful that we serve a Lord that every single day gives us an opportunity to repent of that. And not only gives us an opportunity to repent of that, but also gives us an opportunity to enter his presence and allow us to feel his Holy Spirit and allows us to be able to once again go back to that first love. So I don't know if maybe you're like me and maybe sometimes the, the joy of your salvation is harder to find than others, but it is good to know that every day I'm able to go into his presence and find once more the joy that I have lost in the past. And it is good to know that God will be always willing to give that to us. So today, if that's where you find yourself, it's a good day to go back to that first love and go to, to the presence of God and say, Lord, just give that back to me. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you because we know that you are always faithful and good. We know that you are always on time and we know that you are always willing to forgive us, not because we are perfect, but because you are perfect. So at this time, all I ask, Lord, that is that as we worship you, Father, if our hearts are, are, are not seeing you clearly, if we are not excited by what you have done in our lives, or if we are not at least feeling joy and peace about what you have done and what you're continuing to do in our lives, I ask you that your Holy Spirit can come to encounter us and that we would be able to remember the great love, the great mercy, and the great power of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and continue worshiping this morning, church.
his throne from heaven to die for me now death can't hold me down your resurrection power is bursting alive in me to die for me now death can't hold me down your resurrection power is bursting alive fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. That's Psalm 33, 8. And if we head over to Revelation 4, 11, that says, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. We were created to worship our God, to stand in awe of him and say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He created everything. Everywhere we look, the evidence of his majesty is absolutely clear. Creation itself elicits worship of God. And if we don't worship him, we find out when we read Luke 19, 40, that even the rocks will cry out. So church, we're going to sing a new song this morning. It is called Holy Song of the Ages. And our prayer as we listen to this and sing this song is that we remember that there is a higher reality than what we might feel or see around us in our present. That reality is Jesus Christ. He is worthy of our praise, and he is still on the throne today. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world around us. He is still sovereign. He is still holy. He is worthy, and all of creation sings his praise. We may as well join in that praise, because if we don't, like we heard, the rocks will cry out. So let's lift our voices this morning in due worship of our Savior and our King. Mankind in you begin 
Your promises are written in creation. Oh, everywhere I look, I see your plan. Even the rocks cry out, so I'll cry out. Heaven and earth will sing, so I'll sing. Holy, holy.
Let's sing together. Where was the darkness when hope was restored? And where was despair when my God split the shores? Where was the fear when the Lord took a breath? When he stood in power by the grave that he left and no King resurrects nowhere, 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 and nowhere was the time when my King conquered death. Yeah. Where was the sorrow and dry bones arose? Where was the pain? sick touch the room where was disgrace when the king led to rest the stronghold of sin by the grace he possessed and nowhere Singing nowhere, 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 and nowhere is the fear when my king resurrects. Nowhere, 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 nowhere was the time when my king conquered death. presence joy rises let's sing that this morning i see joy rising and i hear hope calling i see fear hiding i hear chains falling you sing it i see you and i hear time my god's yes he is coming i see joy rising and i hear hope calling I see fear hiding, and I hear the chains falling. I see walls shaking, and I hear town running. My God's on his way. Yes, he is coming here. Now here. Because now here in his presence, my shame disappears. Now here. Now here. is near now here now here and now here in his presence my shame disappears now here now here now here oh i stand on the feet when jesus is near and i see joy rising and i hear hope calling i see fear hiding Chains falling, I see you all shaking, and I hear town running. My God's on his way, yes, he is coming. And I see joy rising, I hear hope calling. I see and I hear chains falling, I see you all shaking, and I hear town running. Cause my God's on his way. Yes, he is coming. My God's on his way. My God's on his way. My God's on his way. Yes, he is coming. My God's on his way. My God's on his way. My God's on his way. Yes, he is coming. Give him a hand of praise this morning, church. He came once and he's coming again. Amen. Amen. Y'all can have a seat. Woo! Amen. 
I love it when we sing truth. I mean, I think we always do, but man, that is good. Such a reminder of, uh, of who our God is and what he is doing. You know, uh, another reminder uh, that we had last week was our 150 year anniversary and we were reminded of all the ways that God has been faithful to us in the past. Uh, We were reminded of our church's mission that began all the way back in 1870 to make disciples and to see this river flow out of Fleetwood and beyond and here we are and, uh, and God is still doing it. And this week is just the first week in the next 150, right? And so we are here and we are anticipating good things that God is going to do. Well, lest we think that we got past 150 and whew, we can relax now, this weekend was homecoming weekend in Fleetwood. And so it was another crazy, awesome, busy week uh, for those that live in this area. We had a parade on Friday where I, I believe all the candy that Boyers has stocked up for the last month got thrown onto the streets of Fleetwood. Uh, I think we should change the name of the parade from the homecoming parade to the candy parade because I think every single float is throwing candy anymore. It's just what happens. And so, uh, man, if you've got kids and they like candy, you ought to bring them to the Fleetwood homecoming parade next year. You could sit there for about five minutes and fill up an entire sack full. But uh, it's an awesome time. And we got to celebrate, you know, some of the things that, that Fleetwood is all about. And after the parade, we had a big bonfire over at the park, which was pretty cool. And uh, yesterday, of course, it was, you know, time for the games, right? It was a soccer game, followed by 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 a football game. So you can see what's important in Fleetwood. And Kaylor, I'm sorry, it's not football. (laughs) Oh, yes. But it was a great day, was it not? And you know, when I, when I say this phrase, there's no place like home, what do you think of? Yeah, if I, if I would have changed the cadence, you definitely would have thought of it, right? There's no place like home. There's no place like home. You would have been all over that, right? It doesn't matter what generation you're from. If you were alive when this movie first came out, or if you're a young person today, like everybody has seen The Wizard of Oz. It's just beloved in our country. Uh, it's the story of a young girl named Dorothy and her little dog, too. <laughs> and they go on this amazing adventure to this wondrous land called Oz, and they meet munchkins and a talking scarecrow and a tin man and a cowardly lion, and together they go on this incredible adventure as they follow the yellow brick road, right? And they go all the way to the land of Oz, and they meet this wizard, and when they get there, all of her friends sort of get what it is that they want, but what does Dorothy discover that she wants more than anything? She wants to go back home to her her place in Kansas where her family is and her friends are. And so she wants to go home. And Glinda, the good witch of the north, tells her how to do this, right? All you got to do is take those ruby slippers that you've been carrying around this whole journey and put them on and click your heels three times and say, there's no place like home, right? (laughs) Three times. And the next thing she knows, she's back in Kansas and everything is good again. Well, today we are having a homecoming of sorts ourselves. We are returning to the book of John. We've taken a short hiatus from that as we had uh, a missionary family come and speak. And then last week we celebrated our anniversary and so we sort of did a a one-off message there. But we're back into the book of John this week. It's kind of a homecoming for us to return to uh, this incredible book that we've been studying. And if you remember what Pastor Marcos preached about a few weeks ago, Jesus and his disciples went on a little journey to a strange and wondrous land themselves, didn't they? They went to the land of Samaria, and they discovered some interesting things when they went to Samaria. There were no flying monkeys in Samaria, but there were some things that were pretty strange to a bunch of Jewish boys that were following Jesus, right? They thought we should probably go around, but Jesus said, no, we got to go through. And when they got there, they found Jesus talking to a woman, in broad daylight in the, in the public square, like, what is going on with this? That's weird. And then they went to get food for Jesus because he said he was hungry, and then they came back with the food, and what did Jesus say? I got food you don't know about. And they're like, this is weird. What's going on in Samaria here? Jesus is eating food that we don't know about, you know. Um, what is happening? And then all of a sudden, the whole village comes out to see Jesus, and the disciples are like, this is strange. This, this didn't happen in Israel, you know. What's going on here in Samaria? 
And then the Samaritans want him to stay for a few days, and the disciples are like, man, I hope they've got a Holiday Inn Express here in Sychar, right? It's a pretty strange situation. And so after a couple of days in Sychar, most of the village puts their faith in Jesus. It was this wildly successful adventure, but now it's time for Jesus and his boys to return home, right, back to Israel. They're going to the land of Galilee, which is more of a homecoming. And so they're about to have a homecoming of their own as they return to the Jewish people. But the question is, what sort of a homecoming is this going to be? There's no place like home, right? Well, let's look at our text today. We're in John chapter 4, and we're going to read 43 through 45 to start with, and we're going to see that that John is kind of setting up the rest of the story here. Before he tells the story itself, he sort of gives us a little bit of an introduction here, and he's trying to show us an intentional contrast. Verse 43, after the two days that they spent in Samaria, he left for Galilee. Now, Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country, When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, for they also had been there. So let's kind of set this story up a little bit. Jesus had spent two amazing days in the wonderful land of Samaria, right? And the whole village came out and placed their faith in him, First of all, because of the testimony of a sinful woman that lived in their midst, that was kind of different. But the second thing that we see is that they placed their faith in him because, 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 because they saw with their own eyes and they heard with their own ears and they believed, they were convinced that this is the savior of the world. That's the last Wizard of Oz reference, I promise. (laughs) They were convinced And so after this incredibly successful missions trip, now it's time for Jesus and his followers to return to Galilee, to to be with the Jews. And what I want you to see in these verses is that the contrast between the way Jesus is received in Samaria, the enemy of God's people, by the way, could not be more different than the reception that he gets in Israel. John is very intentionally pointing to this contrast because he's making a point to his readers. And you're going to have to hang on to that for just a second. Uh, It's going to be a good point, but first I want you to see the contrast. Look at verse 44. Uh, I think what John is doing here, he's turn signaling for us. He's showing us where this thing is headed. Uh, Jesus says, a prophet has no honor in his own country. Now why does John quote Jesus on that? Why does he put it there? Why, why this parenthetical statement? I mean, wh- what's the purpose for which John records this for us? Well, it's because Jesus said it, right? I mean, if Jesus said it, he's got to put it there where he said it. Well, not necessarily. I mean, we've seen already that John is very selective in what it is that he is pointing to. He has a very specific mission, a very specific purpose, which is that those who read this work would believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that they would place their faith in him, and that they would be saved. That is John's purpose for all of this. And so we see that John has left out a a great number of things in his telling of the story. In fact, verse 45 points to one of those things. He says that the, the Jewish people, the Galileans, had been in Jerusalem and seen Jesus do these miraculous things. Well, we looked at that story, didn't we? Um, We we said that Jesus went into Jerusalem for the Passover, but the only thing that John points to is Jesus turning over tables and chasing livestock out of the temple because that is his father's house, and it's supposed to be a place of prayer, and they've turned it into a den of thieves, right? And so that's the only story that we're told. No miracles. We don't see any of that. And yet John himself here refers back to that time and says the Galileans saw Jesus do miracles there. Doesn't record them. So why does he record this? Why does he record that a prophet has no honor in his hometown? I mean, if you just go on and read verse 45, it almost seems like it's out of place, right? Verse 44 is out of place. It seems like John reverses course. He says that the Galileans welcomed him. Well, that doesn't make sense right after he said that a prophet has no honor in his own country, but the Galileans welcomed him as he came in. But why did they welcome him? And I think that is where we begin to see the contrast. It's not in what they did, it's in why they did what they did. So let's look a little more closely here. Go back to verses 39 to 42. I know that was the message from a couple of weeks ago. But what we see is that on the testimony of the woman at the well, the villagers came out to Jesus and they begged him to stay. 
Why did they do that? H- had Jesus done something miraculous? Well, maybe. He-, he told the woman everything that had ever happened in her life, but he didn't, like, do anything crazy miraculous, like make something appear out of nothing or anything like this. And so they came and they begged him to stay. Uh, but the interesting thing is that they had a hunger to know more. They wanted to know what Jesus was all about. And the interesting thing is they don't ask for or receive any miracles, right? They don't say to Jesus, we need to see you do some crazy stuff and then maybe we'll, we'll believe in who you are. They say, just talk to us. We want to know more. We're hungry, right? That is the reception that he gets uh, from the, the Samaritans. And so what they did was they heard the words of Jesus. And in John's view, they believed in, in Jesus. And this belief, this faith was actually genuine, right? John records in verse 42 that now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. They placed their faith in Christ, And that is a response that is pleasing to God, right? Now, jump back to verse 45. We said that the Jews welcomed Jesus. It looks good at first, but the question is, why do they welcome him? And John explains this for us. Because they had seen the miraculous things that Jesus had done in Jerusalem. We weren't told what those miraculous things were exactly. John didn't find that to be that important. But evidently, Jesus performed some miracles in Jerusalem while he was there for the Passover, and some of these Galileans were present. And now that Jesus is coming into their region, they welcome him, but I want you to see this. They welcome him not as the Messiah. They welcome him not because they believe his words, but because they know he can do miracles, and they think maybe he can do something for us, right? Maybe we can get something out of him. That's why the welcome. And so what we discover is that the Jews give him honor of a sort, but it's not actually the honor that is due him as the Savior of the world. Ironically, it's only the despised Samaritans who receive him as such. Isn't that interesting? See, John is is big on the irony here. In, In this contrast, I think we begin to understand why it is that Jesus said he had to go through Samaria. Right? I mean, in reality, he could have gone around like the Jews always did. He didn't have to go through Samaria, but he had a mission. God had sent his son to the earth for a reason, and that was to reap a crop for eternal life, right? He came to reach and to save the lost, and so he had to go through Samaria because this is the purpose for which his father sent him, to be the savior of the world, not only of Israel. And the Samaritans interestingly, are the first people apart from the disciples to receive Christ as the Savior of the world. Isn't that wild? (laughs) That that his own people were hesitant, and yet these Samaritans, these half-breeds, these people that were opposed to the people of God, they are the first ones to receive the Son of God. Wow. See, John wants us to see the tragedy of the widespread failure of Israel to recognize their Messiah and to worship him as such. In John's day and in our own day, there remain many Jewish people that are still looking for their Messiah. And John wants us to see so clearly that he has come. He is here, it is Jesus. He is the savior of the world. This is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In so many ways, John points us to this truth and he wants us to see this. And so what he points to is that despised Samaritans are trusting in Christ as their savior. But the very people of God either oppose him or they can't see past the miraculous things that he does to recognize who he is. They fail to grasp the greater thing that all of these signs are pointing to, and that is tragic, according to John. Now, I said earlier that John is making a point here, and it's a powerful point. He's making this to his readers, many of whom are Jewish, but I think he's also making it to all the people that will ever read his book And so John is warning us all, whether we're in the first century or the 21st century, that we don't want to miss out on this eternal blessing that we ought to be heirs to, right? He said in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, this is not just a Jewish thing, this is an everybody thing. He loved the world so much that he sent his one and only son so that all who believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. Jesus came that we might have life, 
And John says it is tragic as he points to in chapter 1, verse 11, that Jesus came to his own, but his own did not receive him. It's tragic. And so what we see here in this introduction is that John has a mission to reverse this trend. He's not satisfied that Samaritans should receive Christ, but the people of God reject him. John says this is not good enough. Jesus came for all people, including his own, right? And so his mission is to reverse this trend. So what he does, he points to the new life and the salvation that is being received by the Samaritans, and he's hoping that the Jewish people will be jealous. Look, they're receiving what is yours by right. Don't you want that? Right? He's pointing to this. He says, you're in danger of missing out. And so John's plea to the first century Jews, but to the world as a whole, is don't miss this. Don't be that person that that somehow lets that truth slip past. Well, let's continue in our text. We're going to look at verses 46 through 53. Once more, he uh, he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, sir, come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. While he was still on his way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. So this is the story. We said that it's already been set up. John has already kind of built a a little bit of a foundation here. He's calling the Jewish people to a certain response. And then here's an interesting story where this guy kind of starts out with the wrong motive, but eventually he comes around to the right response. And it's, there's a little bit of hope. There's a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel. But before we get into the story itself, uh, I think it might be helpful uh, for us if we acknowledge the fact that there are some similarities between this story and the one that is told in Matthew chapter 8 and Luke chapter 7, where there's a Roman centurion, right, and he's got a servant who is dying, and he comes to Jesus, and Jesus, you know, in, in the same way, heals his servant kind of from a distance. Uh, the primary similarity between these stories is really that in both cases, Jesus accomplishes the healing from a distance, he doesn't go uh, into the, the house. He doesn't go into the area. He, he speaks a word, and from a distance, the miracle happens. And so for that reason, there are some scholars who believe John is actually referring to the same story as Matthew and Luke, but he just, you know, has some of the details a little bit different, okay? Um, that, is, that is one view, that this is the same incident. However, I want you to see this, because I think it's important, I think the differences in the stories are actually way more striking than the similarities. And I think actually when we take those two stories and hold them side by side, once again we see the scope of Jesus' ministry. We see just how important it is that he came to do what he did and who it is that he came here for, right? Let me explain. The centurion in Matthew and Luke uh, is a Roman, right? Which means he's a Gentile. And so we have that on the one side. But Who is the person that comes to Jesus here in John? Well, it just tells us that it's a royal official, somebody who worked for the the king there in Galilee, who was Herod Antipas, right? By the way, not the same Herod that killed all the babies when Jesus was born. This is his son, uh, but still ruling in Galilee, Herod Antipas, a Jewish king, a Jewish king. And so his servants, the, the royal officials that served him, would have been Jewish people, right? Jewish king is not going to have Roman servants. He's serving under the umbrella of Rome, but these, these people that worked for him were Jewish people. And so here we have a Jewish man coming to ask Jesus for a healing as opposed to the Gentile that we see over here. And when we take that together, if Jesus came for Jew and Gentile, do you understand that means everybody? We see the, the totality of what he has come to do. On the one hand, we see in John that, that Jesus came uh, to, to save the life of the royal of- officer's what? Son. On the other story, it's a centurion's servant. 
Is there a difference between a son and a servant in Jewish thought? Huge difference. This is not even close, right? To be a son is very different than to be a servant. And so the fact that Jesus rescued both of them from a distance tells us something, that he came for all people, right? We're starting to see the, the, the scope of this. Uh, when we look at the response of Jesus, it's very different in the two stories. The Roman centurion, this Gentile, comes to him and expresses great faith. And Jesus is blown away by this guy's faith, right? It's the centurion's idea that he actually do the healing from a distance. He says, look, Lord, I know that it's not proper for, uh, for a Jewish man to come into a Gentile's house. I, I'm not even gonna ask you to do that. Simply speak the word. I know that you have authority. If you say it, I believe that it will be done. And Jesus is blown away by this guy's faith. He's like, I haven't even seen this kind of faith in Israel. But what about this story that we looked at in John? Is Jesus impressed by this guy's faith? Well, not so much. <laughs> this guy comes and begs Jesus to come with him, and Jesus remarks that these people will never believe unless they see something, unless they see a miraculous sign. See, he's not impressed with the faith of the official. Frankly, he recognizes that this guy just wants something from him, right? And what we see is that, once again, there is a scope here. There's a man with great faith, and there's a man with just a tiny little sliver of faith. It's mostly desperation, but he's willing to try Jesus and see what happens. Just a tiny little bit of faith, but you know what Jesus says about mustard seeds, right? We just have the faith of a mustard seed. It doesn't take much. Jesus is able to rescue and redeem both of these situations. And so again, we see the scope of his ministry. It's powerful. And so what we discover as we look at this, is that we have good reason to think that John is actually telling us about a different miracle. He's telling us about a different incident, and actually, if we look at that together with the other one in Matthew and Luke, we see the scope of his ministry. We see who it is that he came for, and it is all people. And so, let's dive back into our text now, understanding, you know, sort of how this relates to the other story. Uh, verse 46 tells us, once more Jesus visited Cana. Now, those are loaded words, right? Uh, immediately, we should be thinking about the first time that Jesus visited Cana, which we looked at in chapter two. He came to this wedding, and they ran out of wine, and Jesus did this miraculous thing where he turned water into wine, and, you know, it, it, was, it was a sign that pointed to the fact that his grace is replacing the old ways of, of law. But um, again, we see that this is what happened the first time that he came to Cana, but the reason that John records this for us is that he wants us to, to realize what's going on here. This is a homecoming of sorts. Jesus is coming back to the scene where he had performed a miracle, and all of the people there know this guy as a miracle worker. He's the guy who saved the wedding, right? And now he's back. Like, this is great. But they're not receiving him as a savior. They're receiving him as one who can maybe do something else for us. How cool would that be? right? That's the idea here. John is telling us this so that we know the reason why this public official is coming to Jesus in his distress. Why didn't he go to somebody else? He came to Jesus because he knew that he's done miracles before, and maybe he can do something this time. Maybe he can help me. I don't know where else to turn. My son is dying. I'm desperate, right? Jesus, can you help me? I'm one of your own people after all. That's sort of the attitude with which he comes. Now look at verse 48. I want you to notice that even though Jesus is talking to the royal official, he's addressing the entire group of people who is there. He says to them, you people will never believe unless you see a miracle. Isn't that interesting? So often in, in scripture, what we see is that if we simply believe, then we will see the things of God. And yet so often people come to God and we wanna see, and then maybe we'll believe, right? We get the order backwards. And that's exactly what didn't happen in Samaria. They were willing to believe before they saw anything miraculous. It's just this incredible contrast, right? But what I want you to see is that Jesus is addressing these words to all of the people. And John, as he records this, perhaps is even uh, seeing a challenge for all people who are reading this text, right? To hear the challenge implicit in Jesus' words. You know, it's a great thing to be blessed by God. But do you understand? We can have an unhealthy obsession 
with the things of God, the things that he can do, the blessings that he can give, the miracles that he can perform. We can become so focused on our situations and how God is working in them that we can forget about the God who gives the gift, right? It can become an unhealthy obsession. Let me, let me say this. We are saved by faith, by faith alone, not by receiving miracles or blessings. Those are happy things that God gives us sometimes, but it's not what saves us. And the truth is that in this world, whether we're talking about in the first century when John was walking the earth or whether we're talking about 21st century America, there are many people who desire the things that God gives more than they desire God himself. And Jesus wants us to see that this is both spiritually and eternally dangerous. That is not, that is not an appropriate way for us to approach God. God, I don't care about you. I just want the stuff you give. That doesn't work. It doesn't work. Well, fortunately, and perhaps amazingly, actually, given the track record of Israel up to this point, uh, what we see is that the story reaches a turning point here in verses 49 and 50. Even though this royal official was looking for a miracle and not for a savior, uh, what we discover is that in the end, he found both. And it's this incredible turnaround, right? He found the one who would save his son's life, but that same one is the one that would save his eternal soul. And this is the turning point of the whole story, the moment of faith. I want you to see this. Look at verses 49 and 50. I I just want you to see this for yourself. I want to pull out the contrast here, but look at this. Verse 49, the official comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, come with me before my son dies. And then look at the response of Jesus, the exact opposite. In verse 50, Jesus says, go, and your son will live. (laughs) Isn't that interesting? Do you feel the tension that is there? This is intentional, right? This guy is coming to Jesus with his own plan, but Jesus is saying, no, not your plan, my plan, right? Do do you see this? The official says, come. Jesus says, no, go, (laughs) The the man is focused on the fact that his boy is going to die. Jesus is focused on the fact that he's going to live, right? He's seeing this completely differently. And what we discover is that this is a test of the royal official's faith. This is a test of his faith. What is he going to put his trust in? His own plan, or is he going to trust God's plan, right? That's ultimately what this comes down to. Is he willing to trust the word of Jesus even before he has seen anything miraculous, right? He came to Jesus hoping to see a miracle, and if that happened, maybe I'll believe. I don't know. We'll see, right? That's sort of his attitude. Let me see something, and then maybe I'll believe, but what does Jesus do? He turns it around. He says, I want to see if you believe first, (laughs) and then you're going to see incredible things, And so the question is, will he exercise faith in Jesus? That is really what is that question here. It's a test. And we are told in verse 50, the man took Jesus at his word. Do you realize that in that moment, his heart changed? He had wanted to see something. He wanted to to see a miracle, but instead he's given the word of Jesus. And in that moment, Jesus' word was enough. He believed. His heart changed. Something fundamentally is different now. And look at the next three words. This is incredible. And he departed. I don't know if you realize how hard that would be for him to put feet to his faith like that. Not only to believe what it is that Jesus said, but then to act on that and actually follow what Jesus said, which is go and your son will live. And so he departed. But can you imagine for a moment, put yourself in this man's shoes. Your child is dying. And before you stands the one person on the face of planet earth who can do anything about it. And he tells you to go. And you haven't seen anything yet. Nothing has changed as far as you know. But by faith, you're being asked to walk away and say, you know what? I trust that he's going to do it, even though he didn't come with me even though he didn't touch my child, even though I haven't seen it yet. Can you imagine how hard that would be to walk away? And he departed. That's powerful stuff right there. Well, as he heads home, the royal official is intercepted by some of his servants. And and they bring the joyous news of his son's miraculous recovery. You're not going to believe it. He's better. 
And this man, immediately he must know, right? This is what Jesus did. But just to make sure, he says, well, what time was it when he got better? And the servants are like, oh, we know this one. We were just settling in to watch the Eagles game. It was time for the kickoff. It was exactly one o'clock in the afternoon, right? And your son sat up and the fever left him and he was better. It was a miracle. We, we've never seen anything like this. We're never going to forget this. And the man in that moment realized, one o'clock in the afternoon, that is exactly the time when Jesus said to me, go and your son will live. And I went. I was right to believe in him. I was right to have faith in this man. This changes everything. But more than this, I want you to see that Jesus healed this boy from a great distance. Imagine the impact that that had on this man and his household as they heard this incredible story. Like, who can do something like that? Only the Messiah. I mean, the first miracle that Jesus did in Cana was impressive, right? I mean, he turned water into wine, but let's be honest, he did it in a back room. He sent everybody else out. Nobody saw what happened exactly, you know? Maybe there was a little sleight of hand going on here, you know? Maybe Jesus had some extra wine up his sleeves of his robe, uh, maybe he put something into the water cisterns that made it taste like wine. I mean, we don't know exactly what kind of hocus pocus he might have pulled back there. Nobody was there to see it, right? But this is a different kind of miracle. I mean, who has the authority to speak in Cana and a boy's life is saved in Capernaum? Who can do that? Only God. There is no other explanation. There's no other way to understand this. Only God can do this. And so when the father told the household how his heart had changed, the faith that he had expressed in Jesus and what Jesus did, he spoke the word at one o'clock and you're telling me at one o'clock, my son was better, he lived. When he explained all of this, John tells us both he and his household believed. And I want you to see that here's the greater story. This is not just about the physical life of one boy. It was not only the son who was given new life that day. It was the entire household. And it was eternal life, not just physical life. Isn't that incredible? Well, lastly, I want you to look at verse 54. This was the second sign Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. It's more than a miracle. It's a sign. And we said that signs always point to something beyond themselves, something more important. You don't look at the sign and say, wow, this is great, you know? We made it to the sign that says, welcome to New Jersey. Probably not too many people get excited about that. But it's the destination that we get excited about, right? I'm here. I made it to the place where I was going. We don't get excited about the sign that tells us we're almost there. And so the idea here is that there's something greater. And I want you to see this. Did you know that this royal official is actually the first person in Israel, apart from the disciples, who was able to see something more than a miracle? He was able to see the sign. He was able to see what this was all pointing to. And in the end, he found a savior, the first person in Israel, apart from the disciples. It's incredible. He's the first one to trust in the one who was telling an even greater story. First guy who got it. See, ultimately, this miracle was more than a miracle. It was about more than the physical life of the official son. It was about the eternal life of the entire household, and by extension, the entire world, right? Jesus came to save all of us. That was his purpose. And I want you to see this. If, if you don't hear anything else this morning, I want you to just pull your pew a little bit closer they're like, wait a minute, I don't think we can do that. They're bolted to the ground. Um, just lean in a little bit closer. Don't miss this, right? This is important. God spared the precious son of this royal official. But do you realize what it cost him to do that? The precious life of his own son. God gave his son to be a ransom for the world so that all who believe in him might not die but have eternal life. See, Jesus was the precious son of God who gave his life that we might live. Exactly what was saved for this son of the royal official is what was required of God. What an incredible reality. And I want you to see this. It's because of his great mercy that God saved the royal official's son. 
but it's also because of his great mercy that he did not spare his own son. What an incredible reality when we start to wrap our head around that, that God gave his son as a sacrifice for the sin of the world. See, this is more than a miracle. It's a sign. And amazingly, the royal official and his entire household saw the sign. They believed in Jesus, and on that day, they were saved. But I want you to see another aspect of this story today. This is something that that really speaks to me, and I, I wonder if it'll speak to any of you today. But Jesus saved this boy's life from a great distance. He didn't walk into the room and touch him, and miraculously, he came back to life. He simply spoke his word. And all that distance away, the word of Jesus was authoritative and effective to bring about a change, to to drive the fever out of him that this boy who was dying now lived. Do you see the connection with us? We have the Spirit of God. He is here in this room with us. But Jesus himself is probably not going to walk down the aisle and touch anybody on the shoulder today. But do you know what we do have? We have the Word of God. We have the Word of Jesus. And do you know that it is still both powerful and effective to save this day? He can rescue anybody. None of us are too far. Now, I know that sometimes we feel like, you know, I'm farther from God than Capernaum is from Cana. You know, we look at our lives and we think, I- I'm just too far gone, right? But the Bible is clear that there is nobody who is too far gone. God is still mighty to save. The word of God is enough for us. And I want you to see that it is not only those who are good and righteous and holy and close to God that Jesus rescues and redeems. Because if we read just a little further into the Bible, it doesn't take us too long to figure out that none of us are those things. None of us are good. None of us are righteous. None of us are close to God on our own merit. We were all far away. We were all lost in our sin. But the beautiful truth in this story is that none of us is too far away to be saved. None of us are too far gone. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, do you know what the Bible says? You will be saved. Romans 10.9. And I want you to see that there's not a whole bunch of conditions attached to that promise. Paul never says, if you're a pretty good person and you do these things, you will be saved. He doesn't say, if you've mostly cleaned up your act and you just need a little bit of help getting over the finish line. That's not what he says. He says, even if you have spent your whole life running from Christ, even if you look at yourself and you perceive that you are a great distance from who God wants you to be, even if you've spent 70 years in rebellion against God, And today is the first day that you've recognized that that your heart is changing and returning to God. Paul says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. My question for you today is, do you see the sign? The miracle is that this dying son lived. But the sign is that everyone who trusts in the Son of God, who gave his life for us. If we trust in him, we will live eternally. That is the sign. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. Your word that is enough to instruct us and lead us and guide us through this life to become more like you. But Lord, before it ever does any of that, your word is what rescues us and gives us life when we were dead, that brings us close when we were far. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your son, Jesus, and all that he did for us. God, we thank you that we can read this book of John, and we see so clearly in it that it is not about us being good enough, but it's about what you have done for us on our behalf. And so God, today, I pray that for all of us in this room who have trusted in you as Lord and as Savior, God, that we would see this and that we would realize, Lord, that you still love us, that you are still for us, that you are leading us and guiding us. And Father, that you have a heart for the world around us, and so we must also. And Lord, for those who are here today, and maybe their heart is just changing for the first time, God, I pray 
that they would recognize that it is not about who we are. It's not about trying harder. It's not about getting closer. Lord, it's about you who came and died for us so that we might be yours. God, I pray that we would receive that truth today, that we would understand that if we trust in you, if we trust in you, that is enough. We don't need to see the miraculous. We don't need to receive all kinds of blessings, Father. You have already blessed us in the greatest way imaginable. You have erased our sin. You have sent your Son in our place. And God, if we believe in him, we will have everlasting life. Lord, we thank you so much for that truth. I pray that that would never grow old. I pray that that would always thrill our hearts to hear. God, you are good, and we thank you for all that you do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship, church.
this right here that we just sang, that is the response that honors God. That is what he wants as he looks at us. And yet how often do we see our situations and our circumstances and we say to God, Jesus, come here and fix this. And then, you know, maybe my faith will be strengthened when I've seen you done, have done something. And yet how often does Jesus say, go, isn't my word enough? Isn't what I've already done for you enough? And that doesn't mean that he doesn't want to bless his children. It doesn't mean that he doesn't want to do things for us. But what it means is that we need to want him more than we want the things he can do. That is what God is looking for as he looks at our heart. And so as we go this week, my prayer for you and my encouragement to you is look to the God of miracles rather than to the miracles of God. He is the one that we must keep our eyes on if we're going to walk a straight path. So let us go and let's keep our eyes on Jesus. Amen. I just want you. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want.